Welcome to the In The Loop Ministry Group out of the Presbyterian of Baltimore and our Be More Human series event. And today's event is gonna be about Driving While Black. The title is Driving While Black, The Legacy of Slavery and Present Day Racial Profiling. Before we start, I would like to open up in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for waking us up this morning and watching over us through the day. Thank you for watching our friends, relatives, and really every living thing on this earth. With this event tonight, help us understand that there are two main points that we need to recognize is that one, we should love one another as much as we love ourselves. And two, to put you first. If we do these things, we will be following the path that your son Jesus Christ has laid for us. So in the name of your son Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior, I want to thank you and say amen. Amen. All righty. Let's start now. Now, the, the term driving while black, even though it's a term that's being used now, it's kind of new, but really it's not really new because it's based on racial profile. So as you go back in the time when slaves first came here to the United States and to America, there were slave codes that were based on local, state, and national laws. And with these um, slave codes, you had slave patrols who, like the police are doing now, they were controlling movement of Blacks and preventing run runaways and insurrections. Now, I kind of said that wrong. I, I don't mean that the police are doing that now, but what they did, they did the law enforcement. So the late slave patrols did the law enforcement as far as controlling the movement of Blacks. And with the Fugitive Slave Act in 1950, kind of lit the fuse for, for the um, Civil War and allow anyone to question any Black person for proof of their free status anywhere in the country and led to many free Blacks being taken back into slavery if they were slaves before, and if they were free, brought them into slavery. So some of the slave codes are, um, slaves could not be away from owner's property without permission, assemble unless a white person was present, Blacks could not own firearms, and they could not be taught to read or write or have any anti-slavery materials. Now, out of these slave codes, Maryland had some. So the Maryland Slave Code, code back in 19, um, 1664 read as this. And at the bottom, please note the spelling is as written in the original documents. So I'll try to translate as best as I can. All Negroes or other slaves, whether already in the province or to be imported later, were to serve Durante Vita. Two, all children born of any black or other slave were to be slaves as their fathers. Three, to discourage Dobbs freeborn English women who forgetful of their free condition and to disgrace our, of our nation, if they were to marry slaves, thus inconveniencing courts and masters with legal debates over the status of their offspring, any free woman so marrying after the act's passes was to serve her husband's master during her husband's lifetime. 
So in other words, if you were a free English woman and you married a slave, you were supposed to serve under your husband's master. So you were a slave also during his lifetime. And four, to further discourage such marriages, the children of matches contracted after the act's passage were to be slaves as their fathers were. The children of such marriages contracted before the act's passage were to serve their parents' masters until they reached the age of 31. So before the slave codes were enacted in 1664, if you were a child under these conditions, you would have to be a slave up till the age of 31. And if you were a child under these conditions after 1664, you were a slave basically for life. And then there were the black clothes. Now, these black clothes were basically slave codes after the Civil War. And they were sought to perpetuate the subjugation of blacks similar to slavery. So after the Civil War, um, the blacks were supposed to be free, but there were still some slave codes that kind of limited blacks on, on their freedom and what they can do. So in the summer of 1865, the Southern Constitutional Conventions were white only delegates and laws established so that persons of color could not vote, serve on juries, travel freely, or marry a white person. And also they were forced apprenticeships for orphans or children in poverty until the age of 21 for males and 18 for females. So if you were considered poor or living in poverty, you could be forced into some type of apprenticeship. And the relationship of master and servant so these were some of the things that uh, were the rules. Um, work hours were from sunrise to sunset. Masters could discipline by whipping under age 18 and by judge's order if over 18. So if you're under 18, you could be disciplined by whipping no matter what. But if you're over 18, it has to be by a judge's order. Reverse sick pay, which is kind of weird because back then, if you got sick and you couldn't work that day, you literally have to pay your master for not working that day because he's missing, he's missing that money and that work that, that's supposed to be from you. And you can be forcibly returned if you quit your job outside of the contract. Now, even though these black codes were there, there was kind of a loophole, which even though you had these um, black codes, it, all, it did allow newly, uh, allow blacks to acquire and sell property. So if you were able to have the money to acquire and sell property, you were able to do so. Now, before we go into the rules of the road for black travelers, I have to talk about the advent of the automobile. Now, before the automobile came along, say between um, the Civil War, 1865 and say 1900, the mode of transportation was usually public transportation, either a stagecoach or train, or it was some type of public accommodation. And with that public accommodation, um, that's when the Jim Crow laws start to settle in where um, they say it was separate but equal. 
So say if you had a ticket to get on a train to ride, say, from Baltimore to, to, to Atlanta, even though you had a first class ticket, chances are they will put you in the Blacks car, which usually is the car that's at the end of the train. And that's the car that usually where all the smoke from the engine ends up hitting the back of the train. So even though you had a first class ticket, you wasn't traveling in first class accommodations. So towards the end of the century, and then in the uh, uh, 20th century, 1900, that's when automobiles were built. And also, um, not only um, with the public transportation, but also there were segregated accommodations, places that you would stay, you could not, you could not stay in white places. You would have to find either friends, black friends that you know along the way, or um, maybe just stay on that train car until you get to your destination. So with the automobile, with the advent of the automobile, the automobile manufacturing led to lower prices. When um, Heavy Ford developed the assembly line, what that did was lower the prices of automobiles and it gave people the ability to purchase cars which allow for more freedom to travel because you had that personal private space to travel. You could get in your car and go where you need to go. But for blacks, it was a different situation because if you were traveling in a car as a black, you usually had to bring your own food with you in case there was no way to safely stop to get something to eat. Nine times out of 10, you, you didn't stop until you reach your destination. So usually you would sleep in your car in case you couldn't find somewhere safe to sleep. So it was hard finding places to eat. It was hard to find accommodations to stay overnight and sleep. Also, it was hard to find accommodations to use the bathroom. And most of the time you use the bathroom on the side of the road. So even if you had a road map, you could not rely on roadmaps for safe havens. So you relied on word of mouth. Um, hopefully you knew someone who did travel that way. They would let you know where the safe places to stop and go. And, um, and that's what you used. Now, with that being so, The Negro Motorist Green Book, which started in 1936, and it was available up until the late 60s. Um, Anna, can you click on that um, Negro Motorist Green Book for me? There we go. The Negro Motorist Green Book got it many Blacks to businesses that were along the way where they were traveling. And when the first Green Book was published, the American Road was a metaphor for freedom. Yet in the 20th century America, the same road was a dangerous place for Black citizens. Land was divided by segregation, we talked about before, through policy and through custom. So if you were Black, prejudice was severe, a systematic effect to deny access to your basic human rights. Now, as we talked about on our last um, Be More Human series, we talked about the Supreme Court decision of Plessy versus Ferguson, which basically set a precedent for separation of race in the United States, where it was separate. They call it separate but equal, but it was really separate but unequal. So what the Green Book did was allow, it was a publication was allow people when they plan a trip to plan their trip safely where they can 
stop at places that were black owned or were uh, were allowing blacks to um, to either stop for gas, you would stop for accommodations or even places to eat. And and allowed the black family to travel, gave them more freedom to do things that whites were able to do and that they were just learning how to do. So instead of having that freedom to do it and not have um, any backlash, um, the Green Book was something that really helped and allowed them to travel. Um, I have a copy of a Green Book, but I cannot find it. So I apologize to everyone for that because that's something that I bought a, about a year ago and I knew I wanted to do this event and I cannot find it now. So this is a, a, a great statement right there. The, the American population of travel symbolizes freedom. So if you're able to travel, it's another sign of you being free. Now, in the 1950s, there was an interstate law, which I think Eisenhower was the president at the time, uh, wanted to make trips faster for everyone. So they developed what they call the interstate. If you know how the interstates run, all the odd numbers run from north to south and all the even numbers run from east to west. So you notice that I-70 goes east to west and I-95 goes north to south. And then you start Say if you start on the west side of California, the highway that runs north to south is Highway 5. And the major highway that runs on the east side is 95. And that's how it is along the country. It goes from 5 to 95 from west to east. And then from south to north, it goes from, I think, Interstate 10 up to Interstate 90, which runs through like the Dakotas and Minnesota. So that, that's how the interstates were, were developed. Interstates in the 1950s helped by making trips faster and helping to avoid back roads and small towns with local law enforcement and judicial oversight. So the, the interstates really helped last because they had a chance to bypass those towns that were sundown towns, which did not allow blacks to be in those towns at, uh, you know, overnight. And then um, it, it allowed them also to travel at night because when you travel at night, um, all the cars look the same. You can't see who's in the car, or whatever. You could travel at night, you could cover good distances um, to get to your destination. But as great as the interstate idea was, to build these interstates. However, many black communities were decimated as interstates powered through their communities without political clout. Now, to stop the displacement of redlining and urban planning. So when they planned these interstates, they wanted to go through the, the how would you say, the path of least resistance. So they plan the interstates to go through poor neighborhoods or neighborhoods that didn't have that political power to fight back. Now, we're gonna play a, a video right now of, um, of an example of, of how that, that happened with the interstates. Uh, two, two items in particular. Mm -hmm. In the, uh, well, this was after the interstate, after the interstate was put in, but I, I remember stories in the neighborhood about the process. Okay. And one was when we were living down in Federal Hill, and Federal Hill had originally been scheduled to be demolished for an interstate connection that was going to 
uh, carry I-70 west, um, oh, between east and west. And the predominantly white community down there put up a real, uh, they, they were politically very active in trying to prevent that. And they did. And by contrast, I'm well aware of what happened along the, uh, basically the Route 40 line, where um, there was a, the extension of I-70 was supposed to go through that part of town. And they, they demolished that part of town in preparation for putting I-70 through. But then because of the Federal Hill uh, refusal to allow it to happen, the uh, area demolished by uh, in, in the Route 40 area, the connection out to I-70 on the west side of town never, never got built. There's just oh. that stub extending from I-70 into the city, uh, maybe a quarter mile or half a mile, mm -hmm. and connects up with Cook's, Cook's Lane near Edmondson uh, Village. So there were there were communities and homes all along there, all the way up to the Beltway that were demolished. Oh, okay. well, not all the way out to the Beltway, no. Mm -hmm. But you know, the, the area where there's now the stub of a highway, yes, um, that's not not really being used mm -hmm. much in in the area parallel to Route 40. I've forgotten the the uh, road street names down there, but. So the original plans were for 70 to go right all the way the through city. the city, yeah. do Federal Hill and come out near 95, I'm just guessing, on the other I, side. I don't, I don't know, after Federal Hill, I don't know where it was supposed to go. But it was Federal Hill that put up the, um, at least as I've heard the story, mm -hmm. it was Federal Hill that uh, put up a political fight over it, won the fight, but in the process, the damage had already been done in in West Baltimore. I'm going to get the the real sto story on what happened with I-70 because my own uh, remembrance of that is just I wasn't here at the time, mm -hmm. and that's all based on sort of the the lore in the neighborhood where I where we were living down in in uh, Federal Hill. I okay. was proud of the fact that they had stopped it. Yes. It was a um, it it was an area that was at the time largely immigrants. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was beginning to be beginning to be um, around what year was this? Well it's uh, no sorry. I was I was living there in the eighties. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. I but... was hearing stories from back. Okay, in the about what happened. Okay, I understand now. And at that time, it had been largely an immigrant community with a few uh, younger professionals, a few yuppies beginning to move in. Mm -hmm. And but some of them were fairly well connected, and they they really put up a stink about it. And it was actually, well, it was a good thing from the point of view of South Baltimore development because, um, you know, if that neighborhood had been destroyed, that's an area that's now very well, uh, it, it's a fairly expensive part of town, actually. You're giving me honest answers, and that's what we're looking for, George. You're, you're giving me answers, I, you know, that we need. You know, your insight, because the insight don't have to be from black people. I want insight from everybody on what went on during that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just trying to put it together. But um, I, I the, definitely the information that you, you gave me about traveling abroad, the camping part, I really like. And, um, and about um, I-70. So, yeah, I'm going well. to get the, the real sto story on what happened with I-70 because my own uh, remembrance of that is just, I wasn't here at the time. Mm -hmm. 
And that's all based on sort of the, the lore in the neighborhood where, I, where we were living down in, in uh, Federal Hill. Oh, okay. I'm proud of the fact that they had stopped it. Yes. It was a, um, it, it was an area that was at the time largely immigrants. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was beginning to be, beginning to be. Um, Around what year was this? Well, it's, uh, no, sorry. I was, I was living there in the 80s. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. I but, was hearing stories from back Okay, about history. what happened. Okay, I understand now. And at that time, it had been largely an immigrant community with a few uh, younger professionals, a few yuppies beginning to move in. Mm -hmm. And But some of them were fairly well connected, and they, they really put up a stink about it. I see. And it was actually, well, it was a good thing from the point of view of South Baltimore development, because, um, you know, if that neighborhood had been destroyed, that's an area that's now very well, uh, it, it's a fairly expensive part of town, actually. Yes. So it, it could have been destroyed by the highway construction if they hadn't uh, succeeded in blocking it. Mm -hmm. But the tragedy is that their blocking made the neighborhoods that had this. Well, it's, uh, no, sorry. I was, I was living there in the 80s. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. I but, was hearing stories from back Okay, about history. what happened. Okay, I understand now. And at that time, it had been largely an immigrant community with a few uh, younger professionals, a few yuppies beginning to move in. Mm -hmm. And But some of them were fairly well connected, and they, they really put up a stink about it. And it was actually, well, it was a good thing from the point of view of South Baltimore development because, um, you know, if that neighborhood had been destroyed, that's an area that's now very well, uh, it, it's a fairly expensive part of town, actually. Yes. So it, it could have been destroyed by the highway construction. And thank you, Mr. George Fisher of Knox. Uh, we appreciate that. Also, during this time with the um, ability for, um, for people to now, because this is around the 60s, this is around 1964, um, around the Civil Rights Act. So around this time, um, what that did was prohibit discrimination on basis of race, color, religion, and gender or national origin. And what it did opened up accommodations for everyone. And also with the Interstate Commerce Commission in 1961, blacks were able to travel on public transportation without discrimination, trains, buses, and planes. And also it called for the removal of whites only signs on all interstate transportation. But with this, what that did was almost made the Green Book obsolete. So from the mid to the late 60s, the Green Book, the businesses and all the black businesses that were, um, that were using the, the Green Book, all the people who were using the Green Book and going to these businesses, they were, stop going to these businesses because now they were able to go to the Holiday Inn uh, and other places where they were accepted now where they weren't accepted before, which causes those businesses to go um, to go under and also causes the, basically the end to the Green Book. Now from this about the 70s to the 90s, that's when you had the black migration to the suburbs, which also led to the racial profiling. Um, I can be an example of that because in the 90s, in that period of time, I had moved um, to the suburbs. I bought a house 
in this area called Bay Country, which is right off of Ebenezer Road. And um, my backyard back the um, Gunpowder State Park. It's a community that basically um, just was built like in the past three or four years. And um, when I had moved in, um, there were very, very, very few blacks there. Now, even though the racial profile and you had the looks and everything, but I think what really um, kept me from um, feeling that wrath was the fact that I had, I was working for UPS and they looked at me as a guy who had a family, I had a wife and kids and um, had a decent job. I wore that uniform, that UPS uniform. So that kind of like shielded me from any of those racial tensions that, that could happen. So it, it led me to believe, well, what if I had moved there as a, a single man, drove an expensive car, and maybe did not wear that uniform where they had an idea where I was working? Would I have been treated differently? I would never know, but it's still, it's in the back of your mind. So you still, um, when the blast start moving out into the suburbs, you still have that deep seated thought within whites is, do we want him there? Now, the house that we moved in wasn't our first choice. Our first choice, we were the first ones to put a contract in, but for somehow, some reason, we never got that house. And um, the, the contract was for their asking price. And kind of find out later that uh, a white family moved in and they got that house for about $7,000 less than uh, what our asking price was. So um, learning experience, but um, we just kept moving on. We found another house in the same development and that's where we were for a while. So with the, um, to, to, to battle against the racial profiling that, that's happening from say the 70s up until now, um, with that growth of electronic communications and television from the 60s, things started before the 60s and the 50s, there was no television. So when things happened, the word didn't get around. It might got around with word of mouth, but with the advent of the television and the news, Walter Cronkite, you started seeing incidents of um, racial violence on TV. And it started making it a, um, making that, inc those incidents um, an awareness to the general public. And now that you have the 24 um, hour news cycles, which basically started probably in the late 80s with um, CNN and places like that, and with social media. Social media has been a big boom as far as getting the word out is what's going on in the world. Now, sometimes with social media, you have to go with the, the good, the bad with the good. But with that, it helped expose pol police brutality. So our next interviews, our next, we have a couple audio and, and, um, and one video of um, pretty recent incidences that happened in this area, in the Baltimore area, and with people who you know who live in this area. And these are their stories. Well, the only thing that, uh, you know, that... Well, the only thing that, uh, I was traveling from Baltimore to a uh, place which is my home 
which is Lumberton, North Carolina. And on my on my way from Baltimore to Lumberton, uh, as a young black guy, uh, my mother told me to be careful not to be speeding and all like that going down. But you know, you at that time you you think you like everybody else, every teenager, and think they know more than anybody else. Mm-hmm. So I was traveling down 95. I get down there by Richmond. And as I'm traveling down the road, the state police come from nowhere. And he pulls me over. Mm-hmm. And he says to me, Do you see your driver's license and registration card? So which I showed him. And I asked him, I said, well, you know, what was I doing? Uh, was I doing anything? He said, yeah, you were speeding. And I, I, I said, I, well, I, was, I don't know. I said, the speed limit, at that time, the speed limit was 75 miles an hour. Yeah. <laughs> and I said to him, the speed limit is 75, but I'm only driving 70. He said, you wouldn't be, perhaps, be calling me no liar, you, would you? Mm-hmm. I said, no, but I just know I, I thought I was running 70. He said, well, anyway, give me, give, uh, let me, uh, give me your driver's license and reservation call and follow me. So I said, okay. So I had to follow him back down through this little country road and back down to the woods and all. And now that I think about it, um, uh, you know, it was dangerous to do it at the time, but my mindset wasn't there. So when he, he parked his car and walked back over to my car, he says, Sit right here, and someone will be out to get you in a minute. <laughs> so I'm sitting in the car, and after a while, this guy comes out, and he got a robe on like a judge. And I said, I said, you look just like the police officer that stopped me down the road back there a few minutes ago. He said, I am. He said, I'm the judge, the policeman, and everything. I got you, and so that means you can't lie to me. And so we walked on back in the courthouse, a little courthouse, and he asked me, how did I plead? And I told him, I, you know, well, uh, I don't know. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm innocent. He said, now you're guilty. They say, uh, you said you're on your way where? And I said, I'm on my way down to my home, uh, Lumberton. He said, uh, how much money you got in your pocket, boy? And I said, well, uh, I got about $80, I guess. He said, you don't need that much money to go down to your home. He said, uh, give me 40 of them dollars, and I, I'm going to let you go. And I said, give you 40 of my, give you 40 dollars? He said, yeah. He said, I could, I could take 50 and, t- and send you back home. And I said, okay. So I gave him the, the forty dollars. And uh, when I gave him the forty dollars, he said, "Look, here, take this note. Keep this note with you. And if anybody else stop you uh, on this line, on this side of Richmond, before you get to the North Carolina line, just show them this note, mm-hmm. and they'll let you go." Hmm. Now, was so, he was he in uniform? Yes. In a police car. Yes. Hmm. Yes. So incidents like that happen um, all the time. I I I have seen uh, you know where a uh, white policeman just walk up to a black man and slap him mm-hmm. for no apparent reason at all. Just slap him upside the head and, you know. Mm-hmm. So when, uh, uh, you know, we talk about how far have we came as being a black man. Mm-hmm. We came a long ways, but we still got a long way to go seemingly. Mm-hmm. So I, 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 I'm gonna, on that note, I'm going to stop talking about me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I do pray. And that was Mr. Andrew Page.
Next, we have Mr. Clarence Austin. Of any of the trips that you have taken, um, uh, did you have any encounters with uh, white people? When I say that, that didn't sound too too great. But um, I mean, did you have any problems with whites outside of the area that you lived in? Say if you was going to North Carolina, or on your way down to North Carolina, or on your way back, or or wherever. Yes, I did. But I wasn't driving. My stepfather was driving. And, and you was a passenger? Okay. I was a passenger. So uh, my mother, me, my, my sister, I only think my other brother went. I think it was like five of us in the car. Uh, this was you was about how old were you around? I'd say about 15. About 15. How old are you now? 78. 78? All right. I'm up here with Charlie Johnson. <laughs> uh, you're doing you're doing fine. You're going, you're going strong. So what happened? What happened uh, during oh, yeah. that? Uh, you know, during them, I uh, think, let me see, during that time, let me see, was it when in 62? It was around 61, I would say 61, mm -hmm. when we first started going down to, uh, he was going, well, my stepfather was from Florida. Okay. And when he got out of the military, you know, you no, know, when he was uh, stationed out at Fort Meade in his last couple of years that he was in the military, and that's when he met my mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he got a job at the point, that's when we found out that he was from Florida. We didn't know any difference coming up. Mm -hmm. So um, he said he was, we was going, he was going, he got that 13 week vacation from the point and we was going to Florida. We had never been to Florida in our life. And only way you could go was 301. Yeah, that was, uh, so that was before the interstates? Before the were, interstates. Were built, okay. Um, I think Eisenhower was in the office when uh, those interstates started. Um, so we, we go in, now Maryland was fine. Driving out of Maryland was fine. Mm -hmm. Wasn't until you got into Virginia. There's one place in Virginia. What is the name of that place? Bowling Green. Bowling Green, Virginia. Bowling Green, Virginia. If you saw the sign saying 20 miles an hour, the blacks better do 10. Mm. And they would pull you over. And uh, and that's the I think that was the first time I saw eggs thrown at the car. Yeah, my stepfather always had a car that he would, well, you probably seen one of them. He had everything on it. Mud okay, uh, were you stopped or were you just driving through when the ace was thrown? We was just, you know, you're doing that 10 miles an hour. Okay. And they threw, and they threw those eggs at your car. Mm. And so me, when I went into service, my mind changed. I was more militant than anything. <laughs> I, I said, see. I, I said, that's not gonna happen to me. I said, I'll I said, I put that uniform on to serve this country. And they say you're supposed to uh, uh, protect the people. I'm protecting myself first. Okay. And that's the the way I that's the way I thought. And then let me say, was well, this time, uh, I, did, I just thought of that. The 68 riot, 
Okay, hold on. Before we go there, um, you guys was going through Bowling Green and you had the ace on that too. Were you stopped by police or did you have any other incidents during that trip? No, you just have to slow down. Okay. You can't do uh, a black, uh, I've, I've noticed no black person during those times would go through a Bowling Green. Speed limit is 20 when you come into the city. That low? That, that was for the white folk. Black folk, it was 10 miles an hour. Because if you go through Bowling Green doing 20, they're going to get you. Okay. And that was widely known among the blacks. Yep. Okay. And the other place in Virginia, Brunswick County. That's just before you're getting into North Carolina. Okay. Uh, um, going through going 301 way still, correct? Yeah, no, in Brunswick County, now you got the 85 um uh interstate. Okay, okay. Uh -huh. So, so you're going, you're going um, southwest. South, southwest yes. on, on 85. Uh -huh. Now, as you get into, now everybody knows about, well, I know everybody that I know know about it. Uh, Dinwiddle County? I've seen the signs driving that way, yes. Don't get caught in that county. Oh, you definitely get a ticket. <laughs> Brunswick County is the county, the last county out of Virginia off the 85. Okay. Now, I remember my, my, sister, my car was loaded. I had a 65 Oldsmobile then. Mm -hmm. And we had stopped at the uh, service station to, to, to gas up. As you come off out of the service station, you got the exit for 85, getting on 85. And going down the exit, you, you can't uh, go speeding down there. You had to go in slow. Next thing I know, I was pulled over. Another state trooper. And I'm wondering what's wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said I was speeding and he had been following me for the last five hours. I mean, five miles. There's no way in the world he could have followed me for five hours because from that exit, you only got two miles and you in Virginia. Yeah, and also you had just stopped. So you had, you're just pulling back onto the road. Yeah, and he pulled me over. I couldn't even hardly make it up the bag. The speed limit I think at that time was like uh, 65. I couldn't even do 40. <laughs> the way that car was loaded down and we trying to make the hill. <laughs> Everything going past me, and he pulls me over. Mm, I see. And and guess what? Took me right to that uh, little. Told me to follow him, and I followed him. I don't know where I was down in there, but anyway, little like country area. Mm -hmm. Come up this dirt road, and you had to pay this. Uh, I don't know what you call them, but I had to pay twenty five dollars right there on that spot. No, oh, there, there was no writing you a ticket and then you no, no send it in the mail. No ticket, no nothing. Wait a minute, he didn't even write you a ticket? Nope. Told me to follow him. Whoa. It was a state trooper. He had one of them black Chryslers. <laughs> oh. I said, yep. Yeah. That's the, that was the second time. But I can tell you now. Every time since then, mm. every time I went south on eighty-five, I said they got to catch me. I said if the speed limit is seventy, I'm doing seventy-five and eighty. You catch me, you gonna have to speed. Me. And that's what I think about that county. Oh. And all the other counties, I'm nice. Brunswick County, I ain't nice. Okay, well, I, with the technology that's out now, you're able to take a picture of the license plate. You might can file some type of grievance or anything, or or even fight the ticket. Or he would have to write you a ticket. He couldn't just stop you. Yeah. So, the, the so they just stopped you. 
They did not write a ticket. They nope. just told you to come to this little spot, pay $25. Well, what if you didn't have $25? I would have been in trouble. I would have been locked up. And so, oh, wow. He would have had to write a ticket then. That, okay. Whoa. And now, our next interview is Miss Bettina Scott. And then I need you to um, go back. No more. Um, this is the audio. All right, so it, it's it's recording, so you can okay. Yeah, go ahead and tell I me about say, it. I was in the hospital, and Jason and his friend Craig, along with Joey, had come to visit me. And mm -hmm. so, when visiting hours were over, he, of course, with his friend and brother, started on their way home across Northern Parkway. Mm -hmm. And when they got about. I guess before they reached, I guess it was, it was still in, the, it was still in that area of Northern Parkway right before you got to Sinai Hospital. Mm -hmm. And um, he saw all these cars that were some were police cars, but they were also plane, you know, plane cars. Mm -hmm. And so they were wondering where all these cars were coming from. And so pretty soon a car got in front of him and one came up to the side of him, mm -hmm. of them. And this, and, and this policeman or plain clothes guy jumped out of the car and they had to stop. And so they stopped. The, the police came to the car with drawn guns. Mm. And they put, and Jason put down the window. Now, this is a new, a relatively new Nova. I hadn't had the car probably more than a year, if that long. Mm -hmm. And so they came to the car, cussing, put your effing hands up. And so J Jason and Craig put their hands up. But of course, Joey didn't, didn't understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. And so Jason put his window down and the, the guy said again to him, put your effing hands up. Mm -hmm. And so Jason said, Ma, I was so nervous. I said, I said, Craig, and they, look, they all ride, riding down Northern Parkway with my sunroof open. Mm -hmm. And, and because it was still, I guess, summertime, because when I broke my ankle, it was like in August, I think. Mm -hmm. And he said, Craig, put your hands up. Put it in the, put them up through the sunroof so they could see him. Mm -hmm. So Craig, he put his hands up through the sunroof. And so Jason said, Ma, I didn't realize it. But it was the cop on the other side, on Joey's side of the car, who had a gun in Joey's face. And Jason said, Ma, I was so nervous. I didn't want him to hurt my brother. And I said to the cop on my side, who was a black cop, the black detective or something, I, he said, I said to him, Oh, he doesn't understand what you're saying. My my brother, he's uh, autistic. My brother, he he don't speak English. Mm. Uh, I mean, my brother's retarded. Mm. Uh, don't uh, don't hurt him. Don't hurt him. Mm. And so, uh, uh, so Joey, the guy got a gun in front of Joey, right? And Joey trying to say hi and mm -hmm. shake his hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, um, Jason said, "Ma I was so nervous." He said, "I said." I can't let any, I can't let nothing happen to my brother. I can't let nothing happen to my brother. He said I was saying this all the time to myself. Mm -hmm. And so he says, in the meantime, he heard on the radio 
of the cop's car that was next to him repeat, I said, it is a black car, not a green Nova. Mm -hmm. And he said, then they said to him, let me check your license. So they, uh, he gave him the license and he said, the registration for the car. Mm -hmm. And he says, whose car is this? He said, it's my mother's car. My name on it just as big, Bettina Scott. His name on his license just as big, Jason Scott. Right. And he said, he got, took, his, took his license and everything, stayed about 10 minutes he know he said it was a long time he said but my it might have been a longer time because i was so nervous right he said and so when he came back to the car he expected to have a ticket all right you all can can move on he said ma they didn't apologize they didn't say oh uh sir the the, the this is the wrong call or well, we had the wrong information but there's a there was a call out for, for uh, three guys. And as you can see, this also hits close to home. Now, racial profiling, the American Civil Liberties Union, discriminatory practice by law enforcement officials or targeting individuals for suspicion of a crime based on the individual's race, ethnicity, religion, or national origin. Law enforcement includes person acting in policing capacity with the authority to order individuals to follow their directives in a particular location. Example, security guards, um, airline, airline pilots, things of that sort. Racial profiling often defined as discrimination based solely on race, ethnicity, et cetera, so fails to include cases for any alleged infraction. Includes omitting actions where there is a failure to protect targeted groups, i.e. turning a blind eye to racist elements and terrorize. So the University of um, I think it's SC, Southern California study, driving while black is very much a thing. It is everywhere. And it's not just a North Carolina or Southern problem, but across the United States. Blacks were 63% more likely to be stopped, even though as a whole, they drive 16% less. Taking into account less time on the road, Blacks were about 95% more likely to be stopped. Also, Blacks were 115% more likely than whites to be searched in a traffic stop. And that's a comparison of 5.05% Blacks, 2.35% whites, and contraband was more likely to be found in searches of white drivers. Now we had um, we had the contributions of of our interviews, and, and now we're we're going to go on a more national on a more national level. Philando Castile, Minnesota, 2016. He's a 32 year old school cafeteria supervisor. On his record, he only had minor traffic infractions: no seatbelt, parking too with speeding and a dismissed marijuana charge and insurance coverage issues. So he was stopped because one of his taillights was out, so the officer stopped him, noting that his wide set nose resembled a suspect in a recent robbery. Mr. Castile was shot seven times within 40 seconds of the stop. And here's a video. Well, sir. Good. How are you? Good. Oh, 
reason I put you over is you, your brake lights are out. So you only have one activated active brake light, and that's going to be your passenger side one. Your third brake light, which is up here on top, and on this one back here, is going to be out. you have your license and insurance? Next was Sandra Bland. She was stopped for failure to signal when changing lanes and arrested for objecting to the officer insisting that she step out of her car. The officer stated that he felt his life was in danger, although all Sandra Bland had was her cell phone in her hand. And she died in the Texas jail cell, allegedly by hanging herself. And next we have Miss Stephanie Bottom. She was stopped for speeding 10 miles over the speed limit and not aware of officers trying to pull her over. So here is a news report on that incident. Now, spoke with Bottom, who says she feared for her life in this incident. David, good morning to you. Good morning to you. Stephanie Bottom was driving from Georgia to North Carolina for her great aunt's funeral when she was stopped for speeding and failing to heed to officers' blue lights. Now, the librarian says she was listening to loud music, really loud music, and she didn't realize that the police were behind her and trying to stop her. Here's what happened next, and I want to warn you, the video is disturbing. There's Stephanie Bottom, a librarian, then 66 years old and grandmother of five, face down on the ground after being dragged out of her car. Her offenses, according to police, speeding 10 miles over the speed limit and not pulling over for officers in Salisbury, North Carolina. Stephanie, what do you think when that officer grabbed you by the hair and pulled you to the ground? I was shocked. I was in fear. I was scared for my life. I didn't know whether they were going to shoot me. What have I done wrong? In this body camera footage released by Bottom's attorney, an officer tells Bottom that three police cars have been following her for about 10 miles. They use spike strips to flatten her tires and stop her. You put a lot of people in danger tonight, ma'am. How? I didn't know you guys was chasing after me. I was listening to my music. Did you see the police officers behind you with the blue lights on? I saw them eventually when I did look up. You know, I was like, why are these policemen, you know, behind me? This happened back in May 2019 on Interstate 85 in Salisbury, North Carolina. Pretty exciting chase here. <laughs> I'm at the edge of my seat, baby. As police pursued, one of the officers sounded pretty excited. What's wrong with this turd? Bottom's attorney, Ian Mance, says that Bottom was no threat and law enforcement had an idea of that. They also pull up alongside her and talk amongst themselves that this is an older black female, she's by herself. They later wrote an incident report where they said that when they pulled up alongside her, she held her hand up in a manner that suggested she was not sure what was going on. Miss Bottom's lawsuit alleges that after the incident, the officers congratulated each other and one even brags about grabbing a handful of dreads. Ms. Bottom is suing the three officers who removed her from the vehicle, the sheriff of Rowan County, North Carolina, and the city of Salisbury for using excessive force. She says they tore her rotator cuff. I have a good feeling one of these officers, if not all of them, is going to watch this. What would you want to say to them? You hurt me. You can't hurt vulnerable people. You can't force and brutalize 
innocent people. If I was guilty for not stopping right away or um, speeding, it did not call for what you did to me. And you need to be held responsible. Hmm. Now, spoke with Bottom. Who now, you have heard the interviews from local people. Have you seen what's been happening nationally? So what do we do? Main thing is when this happens, you have this type of incident, you want to live to see another day. Okay, these are some bullet points. Um, hey, you wanna be polite and respectful to the officer. Uh, remember your goal is to get home safely. Try not to get in an argument and remember that anything you say can be used against you. You want to keep your hands in plain sight so it can be seen by officers at all times. You do not want to have any physical contact with the officer. Do not run. Do not resist arrest. Do not talk about the incident until you meet your legal representative. And as if you get arrested, that's what you want to do. You want to. Um, you want to keep that right. And mainly, you want to try to stay calm and in control. And like I was saying before, use the devices that you have. You have a phone. You want to document what's going on. So you have some type of either video record, audio record, where you could later put it down as a written record of the incident that would happen. Live to see another day. So what can we do? Increase awareness of this problem. You know, people are trying to say this, this word is, uh, is negative, but you wanna be woke. Read more, more about certain situations and talk to your families and friends about it. And when there is an incident, make your voice heard. You wanna to write to your elected represent, re, representative and encourage others to do so. Okay, participate in peaceful protests, demonstrations and marches, numbers matter. And that also include, it should be included with writing to that representative. Numbers matter. The more people you can get to write about the incident, the better it is can give financial support to organizations addressing these issues, like, for example, the ACLU, and you wanna support policies and laws that are specific and are not, well, I'm gonna put it this way. You wanna support policies and laws that are specific, that effectively identify and target undesirable policing behavior. You don't wanna support laws that are ambig ambiguous, that are vague and that are exclusionary. Be woke, be aware, but more importantly, be involved. Okay, so, um, Okay, so um, that is it for our, our event tonight. Um, right now, we want to open the floor for any discussion. Um, so if we could get um, if we could get people to um, unmute themselves, if there's any questions, is there any comments that you would like to make? Um, this is the time that we can do it. Frank, is there any way we can unmute everyone? Let's see if there's any comments. And that's Snyder. Hi, hi. 
I just wondered. Oh, hold on. You have to turn the volume off for one device. You can't have both of them going on. If you can. Okay, I'm sorry. Now I can speak. I just wanted to point out the um, lit, live to or live to see another day that those are important rules, but they really aren't necessary for everybody. It's in particular necessary for people of color. Um, those are the things that we have to tell our young men and women when they get their licenses and they're, you know, driving about. Um, if not as critical a factor for folks that for for white people, um, but it does tend to impact people of color a great deal. How you interact with the police. And, and our younger members also, because they're not really experienced of, of, of what's going on. Um, so we as older adults, we really need to educate all our young people um, to deal with policemen. Um, you give respect, but you also want to demand respect. And the way you demand respect is to make sure that uh, you talk in a respectful tone you also want to document, use that phone, record. That way that, that way um, you're covered and it gives you more confidence in what you're saying because you know that you're being recorded and you let them know that they're being recorded also. And ask for identification. And the other thing, Kenny, about those rules, those rules make sense. There's no point in fighting with officers or yelling at them. You don't want to do that, but it can be difficult in the face of being disrespected and being physically um, manhandled to maintain your composure. Um, I, you know, I think some of the point of this driving while black is that if you are stopped and you have uh, any idea that you want to refute <laughs> what's being done or said, it risks your life. So, you know, it makes those rules that much more important because um, people of color are more likely to be, um, to have that kind of a negative encounter. I agree. Um, and I also wanted to mention um, about the road to nowhere. There were a couple of uh, notes in the chat. I think Sharice um, mentioned in the chat that, you know, that that stretch of highway in Baltimore was called the road to nowhere. My grandmother actually lived on Arlington Avenue between Franklin and Mulberry. And I, I was young, but I remember the adult saying, they can't build that road. They can't move us all out of here. They'd have to tear down the school across the street, but um, the powers that be saw a way and they moved all of those folks out of their homes. Yeah. Um, when I drive down that little stretch section of Route 70 through Arlington Avenue, I'm, I'm figuring I'm driving through my grandmother's basement but um, it happened. Let's see. Kathy Anderson, um, did you want to say anything? Oh, I don't know how to put myself on. No, I can't think. Of, there's something I wanted to say, but I forgot what it is. I'll, you come back to me. Okay. Okay. Ooh, we're kind of quiet here. Um. I don't know if, as you know, I'm a, I'm a driver. And if any of my family are on this event, they know that um, being a child, um, I love the, I love moving. I love being in the car. I love cars. I love driving. I, um, I used to be able to, probably at the age of six, to be able to at nighttime tell which car was approaching from the rear just by the headlights. I knew all the cars with the headlights looked like, and I would call it out, um, Ford Mustang, and it'll come by <laughs> and my brothers and sisters would be amazed. And um, it kind of led to um, my career choice, end up being a UPS driver. I spent 28 years there. so. 
this was a topic that um that I was pretty much interested in. And uh, the the road this is America. The road is for everyone. It is for us to get around, to see people, to see places, to see our country. So when you have laws and you have people because they have biases wanting to restrict others from that freedom to see um, see the country. It's, it's really heartbreaking. So my goal is and my wish hope is that everyone will be able to travel. I love traveling and everyone will be able to travel without traveling be that's the key is there any other comments Larry had his hand raised okay Larry oh, just... yeah good evening everybody go ahead good evening can you hear me yes yeah, this this takes me back and it makes me think about uh my three aunts. They was twins. And uh they was going to South Carolina and they was in some part of deep Virginia, almost in North Carolina, and they was ran off the road in a racist, you know, in a racist manner. And it, it tore the vehicle up. And my aunts was messed up pretty bad. And one of my uncles had to go down there in the van and we had to go pick them up. And uh, my one aunt, you know, I had to return them back to Baltimore. She was in bad shape. And uh, she didn't live much longer after that. But, um, you know, that road was something else with, with the hatred that's still going on. You know, you know, it's been going on for a long time. And it's just, it's just sad to me. Because that happened to me one time. And I said, I, said, I know where you lived at, Kenny in the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. But uh, one time I was in Essence and the guy tried to run me off the road, wouldn't let me come off the ramp. So um, I've dealt with some of that. And, uh, you know, the law got a long way to go, man. I mean, that's why I just always ask God every time we take a trip to be a fence around us and bless us with traveling mercies. That's all I got to say. Thank you for letting me share. Yeah, thank you, Larry. Uh- Yes, uh, police reform. I, I know I really didn't talk about it, but and that's very important. Um, it's the same because it's it's a, um, you're serving you're serving the public. Um, I know I being a UPS driver, I couldn't come up to a customer and have a negative attitude and have a bad attitude or just start the conversation off the wrong way. Um, you drive up, you pull someone over, uh, do you ask, do you know why I stopped you? If they don't know, then explain to them. Everything could be done in a civil manner. So we have a few bad apples who, who don't see it that way. And if, if they took the, um, took the grand or rule, treat others as you want to be treated, um, things would be a lot different. Is there anyone else? Kenny, I do, I just, I just, one of the things that I find is really important is the things about your hands, about letting the cops see where your hands are, because that's it's just what every incident that I've heard of on the news or in movies and all that, it's all about where your hands are, where you, you know, and you have to explain what you're going to do before you do it because the, the cops are, some of them are very nervous themselves. Some of them are just plain old cocky, but it's like they already think that you're, you're already guilty before when they stop you. So you just have to be careful in any in, in movements that you make. And um, especially the tone of your voice and all that because they say they're boss. I mean, it's like they already feel that they're right. That's why they stop you. So it's just all about as you say, self-control, control yourself, be calm and all that. And I've had a few experiences, but it's like, it's never to the point where they made me get out of the car and all that business, where people were thrown on the ground and all that. Never had that happen, but 
it's not usually like, what did I do? You, you explain, you ask, what did I do? What happened? Why are you stopping me? And just be calm. Just don't, you just don't know what they're thinking. Yes. Okay. Is there anyone else? Okay, if, if not, we're, we're gonna go to our next slide which is um, in closing and, and thanks. Uh, first people I wanna thank are the contributors, um, the people who gave us the interviews, Mr. George Fisher, thank you. Mr. Andrew Page, Mr. Clarence Austin, and Ms. Bettina Scott. You know, it's, this is a, a tough topic to talk about. And um, they really, they really um, came to bat, and I appreciate all, all of their efforts. We also want to thank the Presbyterian of Baltimore for their support of our efforts. Um, the ITL uh, has really been uh, been hammering on that social justice thing, and we've been just getting. Great support from the Baltimore Presbyterian. So we want you to visit that website. Please, please, baltimorepresbytery.org. A lot of information there. Keep you up to date on what's going on in the churches in the Baltimore Presbytery and, um, and what's going on. Um, also, I want you to join us in our next event. And that's in celebration of Women's History Month. The title is going to be BIPOC Panel of Women Ministers, which will be exactly one month from now on March 21st, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. And that will be hosted by our Executive Presbyter, Reverend Dr. Jacqueline Taylor. And she will be joining by Reverend Fern Cloud of the Dakota Nation, Reverend Young Lee Herzig, who is the Director of Innovation in Asian American Christianity. And we've also extended an invitation to Reverend Rosa Menendez. Uh, we haven't got back, you know, she hasn't got back to us yet, but um, we're gonna have a panel that's gonna be pretty interesting. And there are a couple other invitations that are still out. So we're, we're going to have a big, big thing because Women's Month is in the month of March and, and uh, this panel is going to be excellent. So please join us for that. Also, I want to remind everyone, the ITL, I'm going to say year is from September to June, kind of like the school year. And then June 25th, we're having our celebration of the year. And that will be our ITL picnic at Knobles Amusement Park in Central PA. So mark your calendars for these events. Um, I'm going to ask Annette if she have any, um, anything to say to close us out. And that works with me very hard in the ITL. She was my co convener up until September, but she's still working as a convener. If you ask me, she works very hard for the ITL. And is there yes. any? Yeah, I just want to thank everyone. Here, I'm going to be back again. Sorry about that, folks. Um, I just want to thank everyone for joining us, joining us tonight and to remind you that this session is recorded. So please feel free to invite your family and friends who weren't able to hear it tonight or others in your congregations at home um, to um, take a listen to this recording and others that we have on the Presbyterian website. 
And I'm going to give a shout out to Knox just because I think more than half of our attendees tonight were from Knox Presbyterian Church. So, hey, guys, good job. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Kenny. And thank you. And um, I'd like to uh, close us out with prayer. Uh, let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the people who are on this call on Zoom. Touch their hearts where they can go out and treat others the way they want to be treated. To be woke. To make a difference. Because that's what you want us to do as children of God. You want us to go out, spread that good news of Jesus Christ. And also spread the news that we love you, speaking of the community, that no matter what happens, we will still love you because we are followers of Christ. So strengthen us, keep us all, and until we meet again, we give thanks to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.